NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. So, welcome viewers, and thank you for joining us in this collab on preparing for actually all the different versions of all the different ways that we're going to go back to school. It's August 2020. It's highly likely for all of us that there's going to be some remote online component, and we're trying to think about that. So, we decided at the National Writing Project that we would just hold a collab about that problem. I'm Elise Seidman Adol. I'm at the National Writing Project, and this is a collab, which is a kind of session where a bunch of us meet and take up a problem that we want to think together about, and we let folks watch it. So we're recording kind of a, a problem-solving meeting about emergency remote instruction. Joining us today will be Mike Caulfield, who is Director of Blended and Network Learning at the University of Washington, Vancouver. And one of the reasons that we love having him here is that actually in higher ed, we know people maybe have been thinking about this remote instruction piece a little longer than we've had an opportunity to do in K-12. We also have a bunch of NWP teachers uh, who are thinking about that very problem. So we're gonna try to pick Mike's brain and we're also gonna pose him some of our challenges and we're gonna let you all watch. So let's get into the introductions so the people know who's here. Team, if you would introduce yourselves, go ahead and go off of mute and I'll give you like a shout out uh, based on how you are on my screen, David. Hello everybody, my name is David Lopez. I am a teacher at a private school in Los Angeles. It's a Catholic school in the San Fernando Valley. I've been teaching for 18 years and this year I get to teach sixth grade social studies and English language arts, which is my favorite thing to teach, especially the poetry unit, which we get to in April. So hopefully by then things will be settled down and I'll be in the classroom safe and sound. And National Poetry Month in April, so there also you that. Go. <laughs> Catherine. Hi, my name is Catherine Williams. Um, I'll be teaching English 2 and AP Literature in a small school in South Mississippi. And I will be starting back to school on Monday. And the plan is for students to come right on in and get started traditionally. So we'll see how that goes. Indeed. OK, Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Foley. I'm from Pennsylvania, and I'm a PELP fellow. I teach English 8th and ninth grade, and I'm thinking through my narrative nonfiction reading unit and research genre study. I've been teaching for 11 years, and so I'm excited for what this new hybrid, in-person, online adventure will bring. Ben. I am Ben Woodcock, and I'm a teacher in mid-Michigan. I just finished up my fifth year. I'm going into my sixth year of teaching, and I'm starting to wonder about writing conferences and how I'm going to be able to hold those either online or in person with social distancing in place. Mm, Jessica. I'm Jessica Hernandez-Spear. I believe this is going to be year 22. I teach in the Bronx at a transfer school for 18 to 21 year olds. I have been doing connected learning, as we call it, for mm -hmm. three or four years now. And so I was sort of uniquely situated to start remote learning when we had to go out in March. And um, when we go in on in September, we still don't know what is going to happen, whether it will be remote or blended, or maybe one and then the other. And um, I am here for fresh ideas and fine tuning. That's fabulous. And before we have Mike come in, just, just to get a picture, how many of you know right now how school is gonna start for you? Hands up. So just to say, that's not all of us. So some of us are still waiting to find out exactly what's gonna happen. And some of us know, and then Catherine kind of, as you were saying, you're gonna start, but then we'll see how that goes because you could be back home again, who knows? So that flexibility is key. Mike, I think this is a situation that you know a lot about. So the NWP knows you, Mike, from the SIFT curriculum. We've mm -hmm. worked with you on judging online credibility, but this is actually maybe a little closer to your actual full-time, all the time with faculty yeah. job. So tell us a little bit about the work you do and how you think about this problem that we all present. 
Thank you. I am director of blended and networked learning, and that's kind of just a fancy way to say that we've been trying to increase the hybrid offerings uh, on our campus since I got there in, in 2013, primarily to add flexibility for a lot of our students. We're a commuter at university. A lot of our students are adults. A lot of them uh, have families. A lot of them have life situations that require that we be a little more flexible than the average uh, university. So we have tried to expand, and as you know, like what do you call it, blended learning, what do you call it, a hybrid course. We've been trying to expand uh, those for a while. Uh, in the process of that, as, as Elise mentioned, the process of taking a course hybrid or taking a course online is, is you know, it's, it's a process that's, a, that's fairly time consuming. And, and normally what you say in these situations is, well, there's going to be a lot of upfront work. But over, you know, over a number of years, it'll pay off, right? You'll kind of get the course set up. You have a number of things you can move uh, forward in the future. And so that's kind of the balance. That's the payoff. But we found ourselves in an interesting uh, situation, obviously, like everybody, in the spring and going into the fall, where <laughs> we're trying to move faculty online all at once in a situation where nobody has the extra time, where the time is, is a real constraint. Someone asked me, this morning, what's your biggest, what's your biggest barrier, right, to success? And it, it's hands down, it's time. It's people don't necessarily have a whole bunch of time. And yet at the same time, we're being asked, asked to offer a lot more flexibility to our students and be a lot more flexible ourselves. And so one of the things we've thought about is what types of structures maximize the flexibility while making sure that we're not forcing teachers to uh, just do, you know, three times as much uh, work. So I thought I'd walk you through kind of what we uh, were looking at on our campus in terms of the structure of something we were calling a Zoom Flex or High Flex. I should say that I should say that we recently learned, just Friday, that we will have a, a completely remote fall, and actually I think we're well prepared for it. So this this presentation actually deals with how we prepared previously, but we've now locked on to a completely remote fall and, and we feel fairly well prepared because we prepared in the way that I'll demonstrate here. Just to start with the basics, if, if you think about a class, you, you start off, you know, core of the class for a lot of people is maybe that face-to-face -face presentation. It's not the most important part of the class, but it's, it's a way to think about the things that sort of spiral out of that, Me meaning that if you look at uh, that core presentation, uh, a number of things happen before it. You know, students do readings, they might look at some YouTube, they might have some uh, multimedia that they have to review. And then after it, or as in sort of the rhythm, the pacing of the class, you have some class discussion and you kind of, you have a, you have a rhythm to that, right? The students know what they're doing. The students uh, kind of know how that works. You might have class activities, same thing, sort of face-to-face uh, -face presentation, class activities, come back, more presentation, a little bit of formative feedback, that, that sort of thing, right? Now, if we wanted to get really fancy here, we would say, you know, somewhere in here, of course, you have, uh, you have some form of assessment, right? So that's the basics. And, and when people look at this uh, question of how are we going to do something, the term people are using is high flex, deliver in this sort of multimodal way. Uh, you know, high flex, if you've heard the term, the idea of high flex is you're going to offer some sort of in-class experience for a set of students that might be rotating into your class at various times. You're going to offer something for students that can't come to class at a given time. You're going to offer something for students that are on these synchronous Zoom sessions. And when you start to look at this idea that you're going to just offer like all of these things for everybody, it just raises a lot of questions right away, right? You know, how are you possibly going to be able to watch your classroom in front of you at the same time you're watching the Zoom session? How can asynchronous students have equivalent activities to what's going on in the classroom? You know, what happens if we go back into lockdown? What happens if, like on Friday, we suddenly need to deliver online, even though we prepared uh, maybe for something else? It, it, seems like it's too, it seems like it's too much. So what we have been telling faculty from the beginning is that the wrong question to ask here is how do we create a face-to-face -face class while including an online audience. And this is just the source of much, of much pain when we're, when we're designing. Because the way that faculty want to think about it is, I have this face-to-face -face class, like how do I take that face-to-face -face class online? With the face-to-face -face class, 
as the core of the experience. And it's wrong because it approaches the problem from the wrong, the wrong end of, the, of it, right? I think for this fall, the question is, how can we create an online experience that we can include the face-to-face -face students in, if face-to-face -face is available to us, right? Thinking about an online experience that is pulling where possible, where safe, is pulling a face-to-face -face experience into the online uh, experience. And the way that we uh, began to think of it was this way. Uh, we began to think about, like, what if we thought about the synchronous Zoom session and what happens in there and what that structure would look like. And then we thought about how does this flex either way? How does it flex to face-to-face? -to -face? How does it flex to asynchronous? And so we started with this. We have a Zoom presentation. We throw people into breakouts. Students go into break, uh, breakout rooms, but they also have a Google Doc that they're working on. And so if you look at the Google Doc here, you can see that you know it has sections for each breakout room, and it has a number of prompts that the students are filling out together. And so while they're in the breakout rooms, you know, you're the teacher here, and you're looking there to see how the breakout rooms are going. Are the students doing the work? What are they struggling with? And if you need to drop into a breakout room and say, hey, how are things going? Right? Are, are things going well or poorly? I noticed you hadn't started. I noticed you're struggling with this question. But you can do that, right? You can get into the breakout rooms uh, and do that. You can watch the, the activity of the students as they're working on it. It solves another problem too, which is we found in Zoom, when you uh, send students into Zoom, very often they forget what they were asked to do, like literally the 30 seconds before you send them into the breakout rooms, right? And, and initially you think, well, how can they forget that? And then you remember there are differences between the Zoom experience in the classroom. In the classroom, when you send students into a, a, a breakout gr group or a group, you know, you still have the slide up there telling the students what to do. The students lose that. So the document structures really what the students have to do, preserves that forward uh, momentum. Then you come back and you have this Zoom discussion. Now here's the thing that we have found really useful about this technique is in Zoom discussions, one of the things that invariably happens is that it's very hard for students to insert themselves. And you can you do different things. You can use the chat, function to do this. You can use hand raising, systems of hand raising, and so forth. But the idea that you're going to have this organic, fast-paced discussion in Zoom, it's not going to happen, right? People cannot really indicate so much with their body language when they're itching to speak. The latency is smaller than it used to be, but it still means that people are constantly like starting to speak at the same time, stopping, starting to speak at the same time. It just does not work. So here's what you do, though. Uh, if you've done it this way, you have this document, and you look in the document and you facilitate. As a matter of fact, while the students are in those breakout groups, you're looking through the document and you're planning out what's this discussion going to look like. When you come back, you're saying, hey, uh, you know, uh, Pablo, I noticed here in your group, uh, you, you came up with an example of X. Could you talk a little more about that? And, you know, when you go and, and that student talks. So, you know, hey, Jennifer, I noticed that in breakout room two, one of the topics of discussion was this, kind of relates to the same thing Pablo was uh, talking, but a little bit of a different perspective. Can you, can you expand on that? And so you know what the students are ready to talk about, and you're able to go out and you're able to pull them back uh, into that, pull them back into that, get them to expand, right? And we found that this is a really engaging way to reach students. As a matter of fact, a, a lot of students like this approach better because they're being asked about things that they've kind of thought about, right? They're not kind of being put on the spot with a random question. They're asked to be asked to expand on things that they've already uh, noted. So then you do quizzes, you do what, whatever you need to do. The thing that is useful here in terms of the flex is that if you see when we come back through it and we want to add an asynchronous option, because some students may not have the reliable internet, some students may, simply may not be able to make it at a particular time, it's fairly easy to flex to asynchronous, right? So this, the asynchronous learners come in here and you'll see that the, at the point in the recorded Zoom presentation that people go into the breakout rooms, they're asked, hey, if you're doing this asynchronously, come in and, and answer these questions in the Zoom document yourself. You're, you're expected to participate in that way. But you notice that they can engage with the same document. They might do something that's a little different. They might come in and since all the answers are there, they might be asked, hey, synthesize this classroom discussion and tell me what your takeaways are when you look at what all the groups did. They can, they can do something slightly different that meets the same uh, learning goals. Keeping the digital at the core 
it's actually easier to imagine what a classroom could look like. So as an example, you do a presentation that is synchronous, online synchronous to some, but you have other students that are in the class. And when you add the class in, rather than monitoring both classes, which is really overwhelming, if you're just trying to like pay attention to your class and then like make sure you're answering questions in the chat, very quickly overwhelms instructors. Uh, you just, again, you have everybody work on the same document, the same Google Doc. When you come back, you're, you're here as the teacher, right? And you're looking at these things and you're asking, uh, you're asking Pablo, you're asking, you're asking Jennifer, you're asking your, your different students, hey, could you expand on this? And sometimes they will be in the classroom. Sometimes those students that, you know, this particular section will be students that are in the class. And this particular section will be students that worked on it that were not in the class. And because you're using that document to structure it, it's not as if you're abandoning one half of the class uh, or another half of the class. And so you come back, you do that discussion and, and things work out. And again, adding face-to-face, -face, in this case, uh, more seamless because we're integrating face-to-face -face students into some of these online uh, synchronous uh, methods. So we've developed this blended content studio and we've uh, provided a bunch of materials. Actually, we've opened them up for people to, to use online, free CC BY. And the idea of it is to uh, get people to do the initial structure of the course in terms of the videos, in terms of the different assessments and, and those sorts of things, but also teach them to use some of these methods, uh, these different ways of structuring a class that are more, they're more structured, they're more facilitated. If you're familiar with Stephen Brookfield's work on discussion as a way of teaching, a lot of what we're doing draws from that, that idea of structured discussion and how to create democratic discussions in the classroom. Because what we're finding really is the way to use uh, these synchronous tools and, and some of these asynchronous synchronous blends deals with the same issues of unfair discussions in the classrooms. It, it's just that uh, these tools, if you don't restructure your teaching, just sort of multiply that effect, unless you restructure your teaching around these sorts of ends. So what we tell teachers just uh, as, as a sort of our, our main sort of objective, what we tell them is the three things that we want them to do. I mean, the third thing, engage. And that's how you structure, that's about how you structure your activities. That's the sort of Zoom flex piece of it. The two things leading up to that that we all show, so show is this idea of connect right? How do we use video, how to, especially asynchronous video, to increase teacher presence, to increase the feeling that the students know the teacher, that the teacher understands them? You know, how do we use the, the, the tools uh, at our disposal uh, to do that? And then the, the second thing, we could talk a little bit about this too, is we've taught uh, teachers how to create explanatory videos using some basic principles of cognitive, the cognitive theory of multimedia. In teaching, in teaching them things like this, I, you might notice I'm using a, a, a walk-on board here. One of the reasons I use the walk-on board, even when I'm doing a PowerPoint, something like that, is, is that uh, there's a principle called uh, signaling, which you kind of lose when you move uh, from the physical world to the digital world. And it's a way of making sure students are paying attention to the right things uh, as you talk. So we could talk about that as well. There's a whole bunch of stuff, but I was told by Elise to kind of just throw a bunch of stuff out there that would prompt a lot of discussions. I, I want to say, just to be clear, I do want to say that, you know, we, we showed that Google Doc is one way that we've structured it. It's an example of a basic principle that we've been using, but we of course have many, many different variations of that for different sorts of courses. Anyway, thoughts, questions, conversations. I think this is where folks should go ahead and get off of mute and we'll, we'll have Q and A and discussion. But I want to say one of the reasons why I was really excited for us to be able to hear from Mike is this little flip, which turns out to be a big flip, which is don't think, how do I take my class that I've honed for face-to-face -face in my classroom and put that online? Think about how do I plan for the throughput of the online? And then if I have that planned effectively, I can figure out, well, how do I flex to asynchronous? How do I flex if some are folks, some are folks who are together? And in fact, David, before we started, you were talking about your schools, thinking about the possibility that some kids who may not have internet access at home could come to the building where they could get internet access. It's kind of that situation you were talking about, Mike. And I think you said, so like, who do I pay attention to? The folks on the screen or the folks there? 
So I'm wondering if you want to just pick up on that. Yeah, I actually do. And Mike, I, by the way, I was taking notes like crazy. So thanks so much. That was super, super useful and helpful. I wanted to ask and take totally out of order because I know uh, as teachers, we tend to ca- get kind of overwhelmed. And some of us are really great with screen recording and making YouTube videos and all that stuff. But talking about assessments, I just wanted to ask what, what you would tell other teachers, because I know that when we started this in March, you know, everybody was kind of making up things, you know, as we went along. And I think a, a couple, like a small faction of the teachers were like, you know, you know, we're going to have the camera pointed at their desk and we're going to see what they're up to. And that's how we're going to quiz them and test them. And then other Others were like, well, why don't we just integrate more writing or other kind of like, you know, different types of assessments in terms of like the spelling tests or that kind of thing. So I, just, I was just wondering if you could speak to the assessment piece and what that would look like. Yeah, we did a whole, we did a whole workshop with our faculty on this issue of cheating and, and particularly why, why students cheat. I'm trying to remember the, the book, that, uh, book that we used, but there's, there's a book out that's, that's quite good on why students cheat and perhaps we can share it as a resource later. Uh, and what it talks about is, you know, the things you can control and the, the things you can't. And so when you actually look at, you know, students and, and, and students, the first thing is to realize that, uh, yes, there are some students that, that just cheat. <laughs> you know, there are some students that cheat and they, they cheat a lot. Most students don't actually cheat, you know, as a matter of course, right? Uh, a lot of students will cheat just in, in one course, Right maybe for one test, you know. A lot of students will do things that they do not think of as cheating, but they, they, they believe that given the fairness of the situation, that it's only just that they should be able to, to engage in this sort of behavior. A lot of students actually cheat when they're very, just very confused by the assignment, you know, and, and they're just overwhelmed by that. And I'm not saying that these are the only reasons. Some students just uh, cheat because it's a, it can be a simpler route. But one of the things we've really tried to get faculty to understand is, is there are some things that really encourage students to cheat. One is just high stakes tests, right? If you have big high stakes tests that are do or die, that feels very unpredictable to a student. They're going to seek predictability and they're gonna seek predictability possibly by cheating, right? So low, lower, stakes, lower stakes tests, right? You have to uh, be clear about uh, what sorts of collaboration are acceptable and what aren't, right? These are things you probably already know, right? You want to make sure that, that students take a mastery mindset, right? So we know that students that, that don't have a mastery mindset are going to be more pressured to cheat because they think that skill is something that's inherent in them. Their ability to succeed is sort of inherent or random versus something that's under their control. Uh, and you want to create a sense of student agency and student efficacy. So you want to make sure that uh, students, there's a great uh, story. I wish I could remember the name of the book now. There's a great story that the, that book on cheating starts out with, where the, the writer's sort of hallelujah moment about figuring this out was he was looking at psychologists who, who structure experiments where it's important that they get people to cheat because they want to find out what people say about their cheating or how they rationalize it. And he was looking at this uh, particular example where the kids in this experiment were told uh, that they had to hit a dartboard over their shoulder uh, without looking with their eyes closed and they got one chance and they got a bunch of toys if they got it, if they hit it. And they just found they were able to get a a bunch of kids to cheat. And the cheating wasn't even the point of the experiment. The point of the experiment was actually something else. It was to figure out how they rationalized and and something about uh, the feeling of whether they, they were being looked at or not point of the experiment was not important. It was just easy to get students to cheat if they felt like their success was random. It did, it was kind of, the task was sort of arbitrary. They, it was all or nothing, right? They would never get a second chance. Like all of these things that psychologists do to try to get people to cheat in experiments, if you do them in your classroom, yes, do not be surprised if people cheat, right? So you've got to structure your class a different way. Will some people still cheat? Yeah, some people will still cheat. But I think, uh, again, uh, it's, it's like so many other things in society. You can look at the environmental factors which create certain action, or you can, de- you, can deal with that, you can deal with that action sort of at the other end of it. It's a lot cheaper, right? So I'm, I'm definitely on, on, I think you mentioned the two sides of that. I'm definitely on, on side one of that equation. The, the sorts of things that you do to make sure students aren't cheating with cameras and things like that. 
it's not without a cost, right? If you have ever had a student, we all of you have had students with anxiety disorders, I'm sure, right? Yeah. It's, it's the most prevalent disorder in the U.S. today, right? They're not going to do well on a test where they feel like they're being watched on a camera. If you have students who are from different socioeconomic backgrounds and the rest of the students who feel embarrassed about sharing their home, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's just, anyway, yeah. <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's good. Uh, as if I could ask you one more question. So I know a lot of teachers are YouTube masters and some are using Vimeo and some want to do Google Classrooms. And in terms of just a, a good general tip, tips for teachers, would you say that it would now would be a great time to experiment or just kind of stick to what you know or kind of just maybe learn one new thing or like in terms of like learning new tools? If the students just have to click a link and go to the link and they don't need another login, they don't need another, they don't need to know how to use the tool. It's, it's fairly straightforward. I'm not so much worried the students will be overloaded with tools, right? Whether you're linking to Vimeo or YouTube, they're watching a video, you know, whatever. Do be aware though that it's probably not the best to have one set of students using something like Socrative, which is student response system software, and another one using Kahoot, and another one using, you actually probably do want the students to, you probably do want to coordinate and, and try to um, minimize the number of tools that the students uh, use. In your own course, the key to all online instruction is that you have a rhythm, that you have a rhythm of the course. And what that means is that the students do not have to rely each week on studying some description of how the course will operate this week or how, how the class will operate this week, but they come into class and just like when they're in your physical class, they know what they start out doing, right? If you have a bell ringer, we do the bell ringer, then there's a presentation, then we do group. They know what the structure of the class is and they can rely on that. And tools are a part of that. If you have too many tools, right? And if they change week to week, you start to disturb the rhythm of your class. And so you wanna, you wanna minimize it in that, in that sense. I'm not afraid of, again, if it's just content, if it's just links, great. But I would, I would choose, you know, if there's more intense engagement with tools, I would choose uh, a few carefully chosen tools. I would coordinate with other teachers where you can to try to try to minimize the amount of tools that students have to use. And I would figure out a sort of, again, a rhythm of the class where students know, hey, on Tuesday we do this, on Thursday we do this, and it's not gonna be a, a tool of the week sort of scenario for the students because you will very quickly uh, lose some, some students in that uh, scenario. Awesome, thank, thank you. you. We're going to go next to Jessica, but I love that you said that too, because um, I think the message that some people have internalized is that there's some sort of superstar, magnificent videos, amazing tools. Students would be bored if I just had them do a Google Doc, et cetera, which you're saying, no, actually, and that's not what you should be doing out there trying to find now 500 ways to do something. Get the rhythm, get it something that can be expected by the students. And it seems to me, too, that that means that then they can start to lead. The more that there's a kind of predictable thing, the easier it is to say, well, now you could lead that because you see how we do it. Um, and also they're going to um, react, they're going to react much more to your own fluidity, right, in teaching than they're going to react to any sort of super engaging, flashy new tool, right? Your ability to sort of master those tools and become fluid with them yourself is going to be much more important than the, the, the than a lot of the, you know, the two extra features that this other tool adds. Right, you know? right. So, so right. getting your own rhythm is important as well. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to Jessica. It was an anecdote. About Tell your anecdote. <laughs> Why not? Oh, well, I, it, you know, just sometimes um, in, in a classroom where I had uh, recent arrivals and a, a block from one particular country, we had to have a conversation about cheating that I had never had before because it was more important. I was asking them to do something and they delivered. Isn't that what you wanted? Why do you, why do you care about how I got it to you? And so that seemed the cultural expectation was uh, different, you know, that where they came from, the result was more important than the process. And uh, you know, cheating is very cultural. They've tested like these very abstract cheating scenarios all over the world. And what they find is that all across the world, they get exactly the same level of cheating. Every, every single place. So there's no sort of culture that cheats more. However, 
they have very different views about cheating, right? Uh, and they're very confused by it. So you're absolutely right. Like it's, it's completely- Well, that's, yeah, that's what we were dealing with yeah. was, I, I gave you the answer. Yeah. You know, I took it from someone else, but you are the teacher. You asked me to perform a task. I performed it. Therefore, I have fulfilled my responsibility in this relationship. So I think Lauren, Lauren's going to come in and I, to say that just a reminder that that part of this discussion about cheating on the one hand came from the fact that we have administrators for whom the big question is, how will we know students are doing the work, which could be about cheating or it could be about, are they even there, like on the other end of the camera? Are they even showing up? So the monitorial issues are issues that a lot of our schools are thinking about and I kind of hear you saying planning to avoid cheating is not the driver. Planning for powerful learning opportunities is going to be the driver. And one of the things we do a lot of is conferencing with individual students. And a bunch of folks are thinking about how to do that. Lauren, pick it up. Yes. So conferences are such a big part of my writing reading workshop that they're kind of at like the forefront. I was doing one-on-one -on -one discussion boards through Canvas and we were having small group teams meetings during distance learning to try to support that as best as we could. Cause I conference, I, you know, by the end of the week I've conference with every kid for reading and every kid for writing uh, when we're face to face. So for the unit I'm thinking through um, the narrative nonfiction students select their independent reading books all in the narrative nonfiction genre. And they're invited to then create a researched writing piece, either multi-genre, multimodal, something of their choice. And so throughout that process, we're conferencing, there's that small group work, um, especially the research component, that can be very difficult for eighth and ninth graders as they're looking for something, not just to make the typical uh, research paper, but to find information that's gonna support them uh, through creating something that's more original. So I'm just thinking through and wondering how to support some of those one-on-one -on -one or group conferences in an authentic and supportive way. Yeah. So well, I mean, it, it, it kind of depends on 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 wh what your what your strengths are and the way that you normally approach students. So uh, are you thinking in this uh, situation? Is is part of the question? Like, how do you structure it as a bunch of small group sessions where people ask questions? Do you structure like a shorter one-on-ones? Is, is that kind of the, the question you're asking? Or trying to, yes, and then also trying to figure out, does that happen during synchronous time, during uh, asynchronous time? Is there some time, like, I've been exploring like this kind of moving between the two where you can offer the conferences and not like having anything lost because conferencing is kind of like the heart and soul, one of the main like big pieces of the workshop. So just, I don't want to see that go away. I feel like that helps with supporting students. So it's more like, I guess, negotiating the time to support them and to feel like, you know, during class they could, I always say like quick check-in who needs the first three conferences before I move around to who's on my list. Like, how do I make that happen if we're doing digital, if it's synchronous, asynchronous, like how do I get that same type of support going? I have, I have one thing, too, to add heading into that conversation, especially as a younger teacher and a male teacher at that, is, you know, in the classroom, I'm able to go around and conference with students, but I have the class there to kind of act as a buffer in case, you know, something happens or something like that. You know, even when after class, my door is open, that way I can prevent the scenario of being blamed for anything. What do I do and how do I protect myself online? when it's just me and it's just another student, male, female, you know, whatever, how do I protect myself and make sure that I can still have that meaningful conversation that, that we're starting to allude to, but then how can I also, you know, CYA? Yeah, so my, my wife teaches art at the middle school level, and, and this is a big discussion, right? One of the ideas is that basically everything's gonna be recorded that you engage in in case, you know, something goes wrong. But you know, that's also, that's also, it's not, I'm not, <laughs> there are some downsides to that. One of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is uh, when teachers have difficult discussions with students or when student, when you're having a session where students are, are sharing very personal stories, do you really want that recorded on a Zoom somewhere where that, you know, uh, where that link could be either intentionally or inadvertently shared? by other people. So, so there, there are, there are costs, there are lots of costs to, to like turning everything into 
surveillance. You know, at the at the university level, we don't deal with that quite as much. We, we're it's it's there's, there's less there's just less tension around that around that issue. But I've even heard uh, districts worry that, oh well, if the students were able to kind of come into the waiting room and talk before the teacher got there, what happened if something happened uh, in that context? Right? There's a there's a there's a real fear that that in these sort of unsupervised moments that are student to student. I've even heard people say, oh, well, we're scared to use breakout groups because what happens if someone says something in a breakout group and you don't see it? To which I feel like, like, <laughs> like did you go to school? Do you, do you not understand how much the teacher does not see, uh, like even on a good day? Um, I, I'm not sure I have a, you know, I'm not sure I have an answer to those questions. What I would say is that there are multiple tools available to you in, in terms of creating immediacy and creating distance. And one of the, you know, it, this is probably what we're doing now, uh, especially if it was, if it's one-on-one, face-to-face, this is probably the most immediate and therefore some of the most connecting, but, uh, but, I, but I also think, uh, you know, you know, it, it, it can be, you know, some of the more difficult too, right? You can, you can have problems with that level of, of one-on-oneness. You can think about ways to increase or decrease distance in that, for example, with the VoiceThread tool that we're using, you have an asynchronous video conversation, right? So I record my video, you record your video and send it to me. I record my video and send it to you. You know, it goes back and forth. I'm not sure that's a full answer, but one thing we think about a lot when we think about online instruction is what level of immediacy do we need for what purpose? Because immediacy also often comes with bandwidth, you know, requirements as well. And if you could do it with less immediacy, as effectively, it might also be a less tense uh, situation and one where you're able to more carefully control your own interaction as well as having a, a, a record of it. I'm wondering if anybody um, has some thoughts about conferencing given how central conferencing is to the teaching of writing in general. I, and I would add to that also response groups which in the one hand, you could imagine easily transfer into breakout groups. I wonder if anyone's experimented with that maybe in the spring and has any thoughts about that. Go ahead, Lauren. So we use Canvas. So I used the discussion boards in two different ways. I created table groups where students actually work together long term. It was the same table group they were in when we left. And so it carried them through. So they had the continuity. They were able to talk synchronously during, during scheduled times, but then also asynchronously throughout the week. But it still was kind of like it wasn't as real, I guess, right, as being face to face. And then so we had team meetings but those were also who could meet at what time. And so, you know, distance learning, I'm sure will be different than what we're experiencing. Will be definitely different in terms of scheduling and things this coming year. But I'm um, even trying to get groups on at the same time, pose difficulties and navigating those. And then the one-on-one -on -one discussion boards, similar to what you were saying, where the students could post those questions was, was helpful. And we used the recordings, but the, the, how many conferences you can have in it, like 10 minutes is so different. It's felt like online versus in class. And our school tentatively is going back hybrid, but we're gonna have students sitting in a class six feet apart that can't actually like move and I won't be able to go sit next to them. So for conferencing. So, I mean, plugging in and doing this sort of thing in the classroom, I don't know how, if that really will work, if it'll help or if, you know. So things, I, looking, I'm trying to figure out ways that I can streamline it more and get more conferences in during the time I have. Yeah, that's def definitely one thing we, we he hear a lot is just things take longer online because the transitions take longer, right? You're able, just in a physical space, you're able to use physical space to sort of build your transitions and make your transitions very sort of fluid and you know, opportunistic in the the, the sense like as needed, right, at the moment. Whereas things uh, take a certain amount of planning and structure in the online realm because the transitions are, are even bringing people back uh, to, the, to the front of the class. One of the things you struggle with in a, in a Zoom session is you send the people out to breakout rooms and then you notice when you drop in one breakout room, holy crap, they're completely misunderstanding the assignment. 
I got to talk to them. Now, normally in a class, if you see that in one group or you see it in a couple groups, you go, you go and you say, hey, everybody eyes up here. Look, I, I just want to talk about point two. I, I think a lot of you and you have your little conversation and you send people out. The only way to really do that in Zoom is to, you know, type your like whatever 180 character statement that you can mail out or to teleport everybody like, like just violently back into the main, into the main session. And that's something uh, we were, I was working with a group of uh, faculty just yesterday and we were trying to think of solutions to that, but it's exactly that problem of the transitions just not being as fluid and you lose time uh, because of that. So I'd be interested in other people's thoughts that I could bring back. I think we're going to go to Catherine next, but it does feel to me like conferencing is an example of the kind of thing that we might fall into thinking, how do we take the on-class experience online? And maybe we need to think about what would online conferencing be and start from the other end and just reinvent it. If it's such a high leverage practice, that might be worth spending the limited time that there is on a high leverage practice in a way. Catherine, get you in here. All right. Well, it's kind of a similar issue, but in a, in a completely different context. Um, with my school, we're going back completely traditional. We do have some students who will be doing virtual learning, but they're going to be just put on a program. They're going to do a completely different curriculum than what we're doing in our classroom. Um, what you've already said has me thinking about ways that I can kind of reinvent the way that I look at the lessons I already kind of have in mind that I want to do. But um, in terms of conferencing or even things like if I want to read a drama with my students, you know, that's a text that it calls for a lot of interaction to really help students understand and to see where they're going with it. And my struggle is for those legal reasons that were brought up earlier, we're not going to be doing synchronous meetings. It's either in person or it's asynchronous. So how can I kind of find a way to keep that alive in my classroom? And that might be a different situation than most people are in. But, you know, I want to keep that culture of argument and discussion and revision and conferencing alive. How can I do that if we switch to totally asynchronous online work and then violently back to in-person learning later and then back to virtual again later? Cool question. Yeah. Mike, you're on. Yeah. I think it's hard, but I mean, there's... We were looking at, last week I was talking with a faculty member who is looking at the idea of building, you know, asynchronous interaction over a shorter time period, right? So that there's, there's kind of more of a feeling everybody is in the same space. So she has a class time that's already marked off. And she could have the students all come in synchronously, but for various reasons, she would like to minimize their, their need for bandwidth and, and so forth. But she wants to use that time, right? Uh, and so one of the things she's doing is, is putting a discussion board uh, together. And, you know, at the start of the class, there will be this, this prompt and people will, during the period of that class, have the discussion on the discussion board. So it is something that is, it's, you know, it's all logged and it's, it's not video and it, it probably doesn't come to some of the issues we talk. It's low bandwidth, right? Which again, the digital divide right now is not necessarily do they have it or not, but do people have the bandwidth or not? That's primarily the digital divide. Uh, it, but, but it creates a sense that everybody's in there in the same space. So one thing I think to ask is, is when people say, well, it's going to either be face-to-face -face or it's going to be asynchronous online, is there are other combinations here that, that we can use that aren't synchronous video. And I think exploring some of those, especially some of these low bandwidth ones, is 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 worth our time because there is something about the immediacy of a of a synchronous online experience that you know it just that just does some things that like a fully asynchronous experience is not going to do you know, it, as you're talking and we've all been talking about things like bandwidth and immediacy i would want anybody who's watching this to know we're going to put up a bunch of resources so on the page that contains this there'll be lots of things to follow up one of the things we'll have there i'm going to share my screen for a second one of the things that you'll see floating around and you can use is just a reminder that high and low bandwidth are sort of one way to think about it. We've been talking about that. And also lower and higher immediacy. And if you think of those as quadrants, high bandwidth and high immediacy, that's where your Zoom conference is there, video conferencing. It's a demanding thing, but it offers a tremendous amount of, of immediacy. But of course, there's also audio only, for example. We don't have to see each other. 
But there are all these other tools that actually could be quite wonderful to use and not as demanding. And I think it's back to how sometimes we get the message that we have to all move to a certain set of tools because that's kind of the cutting edge. And it could be that for some of our purposes, email chains or simple discussion boards with students that they can participate in or record a simple thing and upload it from a phone because their phone gives them more uh, interactivity than, than perhaps a, a situation where there's almost no internet. So this was one of the charts that I like for re just reminding us that there are a lot of different things that we could have young people do. And I'll, I'll come off the screen share just to say that some of these things, the folks brought up, you know, sort of legal issues, that kind of thing, which, you know, our institutions are concerned about that. We have to deal with that. That, you know, it could be that a close reading of something with a different way of how we talk to each other in comments about our Google Doc another way to have a conference or take some of the burden off of the face-to-face -face so that then when they sign up for 10 minutes, you spend it differently. So just wanted to say that and then go back to Catherine like, and let you follow up because in a way, what I heard Mike saying to your problem was, in, was if you sort of have your face-to-face -face class operating in a way that could work asynchronously, you get them into a rhythm of a certain set of tools, like maybe a discussion board or whatever that could transfer if all of a sudden everybody has to go home. I was kind of reading that, Mike, into one of your suggestions, but. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think, and again, it may not, because part of what you have is a policy problem and not necessarily a pedagogical problem. And so, you know, it's, it's, those things don't always mesh up, unfortunately, but, but sometimes I think, you know, administrators are, administrators are seeing things through the lens of, of just one type of technology, one type of experience and if they can be shown that, look, there are other ways uh, to do this. You know, there's some other things you can do that are, if you think about immediacy, uh, you know, immediacy is sort of a feeling of, of a connection at a particular moment between, you know, one or many people. Things that increase immediacy don't always have to be synchronous. So as an example, you know, it's one thing to see the markings that like the, the markings that come back on a student assignment and the student looks at the assignment. And that's not immediate to them, right? That is static. It happened. It's a record of the thing that happened. It's another thing to see a very short video of someone going through someone's paper and saying, you know, from this first paragraph, I'm excited to read it. I'm really wondering how you're going to bring this question in, read a little more, you know, and, and do that and feed it back to the student. And while that's still a recording, there's more of a sense of immediacy there because it's catching you in a particular moment. It's catching your reactions in real time and it's creating that sense of immediacy even though it's not necessarily synchronous. And so there are ways to think about immediacy. One of the things when I go through PowerPoints I mentioned, uh, I usually go through with a pen. Why do I go through with a pen? Uh, well, there's one issue here that in our materials we talk about signaling. It's actually a, it's a, it's a way to help students organize what they're seeing. But another piece of it is you know, this is a presentation that's happening now, right? You're looking at a PowerPoint and when I mark on it, I'm creating a sense of immediacy that this, these marks are being made now. I'm talking about this now. We're trying to make, sh make sure that you don't feel that you're just being sort of, sort of some sort of reheated uh, presentation from three years ago, but that you're actually, you're actually, you know, the students have this thing where they say, you know, so-and-so didn't teach the class. And a lot of times what they're talking about is that sense of that sense of the sense of feedback, but also the sense of some of the immediacy in, in the presentation. The, the students miss that when that's, that's gone. And, and some of it can be done asynchronously as well. That's kind of a, like a perfect segue to a, a question that David had. And I would add to that also that before we close up, which we're running close to the end of time, we should spend a little bit of time hearing from you some of the thoughts that you have about about making media. You had mentioned that. But David, go ahead, wrap up this question that actually in the chat, viewers were chatting with each other and a couple of people were interested in this. Yeah. yeah so thanks. So my question was uh, in terms of teacher preparation, I know a lot of teachers have the question of, you know, is it worth my hour to pre-record a lesson, reading that play, doing the voices, reading a short story and kind of anticipating the questions or would it be better to kind of like record the Zoom with light, you know, with students and then kind of broadcast that or, or save it for later. 
you probably predict this answer. It's gonna be really individual to the actual purpose of the presentation. What I would say is if you're dealing with a particularly tricky concept, right? And you, you want to make sure that the students get the best possible presentation for that set of students on this difficult concept, I would pre-record it, get a script, and really, and really make sure that, it, that it's focused. And as a matter of fact, this is one of the strengths of the digital is that very often, because you can think through it you know, clearly, really control the presentation, sometimes a concept that would take you, you know, 15 minutes to go over in the classroom, you can get down to six minutes because you're, you're, you're able to be really intentional about it. You know, for the things that are really trying to pull in that, that, are, that are not so much, for the, let's put it this way. There are certain videos the students will watch over repeatedly because they want to get the concept they want to study. Those are the videos that are worth thinking about pre-recording. There are certain uh, presentations students are going to just watch once, right? And those are the ones where there's not going to necessarily be a substantial difference between, between what, you know, just presenting it once in, in Zoom and in recording. The students will actually even speed it up. They all watch these things at 1.5 or 2, two times uh, speed, right? <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're kind of doing their own little sort of user editing of it and, and getting it to go faster. But, but on those things that are sort of your core concepts, I absolutely, I would make a, a, a more polished video on those core concepts. Well, thank you. Would that be the same for flipped lessons, like thinking about what you would teach outside of the classroom, so that way then they can come prepared to either do, to do some type of extension or discussion? Would your answer be similar for flipped classrooms or, yeah. so or if, flipped if, lessons? If you're familiar with understanding by design, you think about what are those understandings and you think about what are what are the what are the concepts what are, what's the sort of foundational foundational knowledge what are the what are the things that kind of input what are the barriers to them really getting that concept right and those things those things that are that generally are the barriers absolutely those are the things move them asynchronously and then flip when you flip what the classroom's really good for is is for the students kind of parsing through the concept in trying to expand their knowledge. So if you think about the concept, students get the concept, but as we know that students don't necessarily, they're not gonna necessarily natively transfer that, right? The, the domain transfer is not gonna be there. They're gonna get the concept, but they're gonna come up with uh, a version of it that's either way too specific, <laughs> you know, or way too generalized, or not understand how this concept in this area here applies over here. That's where a classroom is, is really great because you, the students have come in and they have that core, but then you say, hey, you're maybe not seeing the bigger picture, right? So that's the sort of dance I see in those uh, particular things. So Mike, we're gonna close with a go round from everybody, sort of one idea that you wanna take away from this that you could imagine applying to your own situation. But before we go there, you had mentioned earlier some thoughts about actually making media Oh, yeah. And a lot of teachers are, in fact, thinking about things like pre-recording stuff and getting it ready to be delivered in these ways. So give us your top tips for that kind of thing. So the, the main thing we teach our faculty, and I think it's, it's been really working, uh, is we teach them three principles of what's called cognitive theory of multimedia. And so the idea here is, um, if you think about multimedia just uh, generally, you have two channels, right? And usually one is maybe an audio channel and one is a visual channel, right? And basically you have two, these two separate channels and they're able to process things separately and you have to make use of that. And so generally there's the way that you structure any sort of instructional video or any presentation is that one channel helps organize the other. You don't wanna duplicate the information in each channel and you don't wanna have two channels that are presenting entirely different sets of information. You want one channel to help the students organize the other. What do we mean by that? So say you're just, the most common thing is you're giving a lecture, right? And so you're, you're kind of throwing out a lot, of, a lot of points here, you know, stories, you know, anecdotes, concepts, and the students don't necessarily know how this stuff fits together. It's just a stream of, you know, it's a stream of presentation to them. So actually, I got this mixed up here. So this is the audio channel. And so what are you going to use the visual channel for? Okay, this will probably be recognizable if you've ever used PowerPoint before. You want the visual channel to be signaling things like what's the main idea, right? What are the connections between these things? And so your visual channel is going to signal, hey, 
This is the main idea, and these are kind of subpoints. And that's how you use a PowerPoint presentation. So part of the idea there is what we call uh, signaling. This is the first principle, signaling. Again, the reason why you don't fill your PowerPoint slide with the exact text of your presentation is because it, it wouldn't function as a signal. The second thing is segmenting. And this is, you do this multiple ways, but if you think about a class, students can only absorb so much information before it starts to become a little overwhelming to put it together. They need a chance to apply that information so that it, they, that information can be set a little more firmly before they go further, right? Otherwise, it just starts piling up and up and up and they start losing pieces of this. Until knowledge is integrated, it's not learned. And we have limits, we have cognitive limits. So in the classroom, you present a little and then you see if the students are processing that and then you give them some prompts and make sure that they're getting it, give them a chance to apply and then you go back to presenting. And in your class, you might have a rhythm, right? And so you're, you might talk for about 10 minutes but then have a little bit of discussion. And then you might talk for another 10 minutes and have a little activity. Often when people do instructional videos, they drop that part. They, they think, well, I'll put all of my instruction in the PowerPoint and they'll just watch my PowerPoint beginning to end. And then we'll flip the class and then we'll have the discussion in the classroom. And so they'll watch a 45 minute video and then they'll come in and we'll have you know, the 45, 45 minute discussion and everything will work, everything will work out, right? It just doesn't work like that because about 10 minutes in, your students are already losing the beginning of the presentation because they haven't had a chance to apply it. So one of the things we teach faculty is either break your videos up into smaller, into smaller segments. You know, one of the things we found is like 15 minutes is about really the max you want to do if you're breaking them up or within the videos, make sure you're, you're prompting the students to do something. So you could record a 45 minute video, but you should say, pause the video 15 minutes in. I would like you to pause the video and then go do this assignment and then come back, you know, that sort of thing. So give the ch students a chance to do that. And then the third thing is just weeding. So uh, weeding is this idea that extraneous material for novices can be really deceptive. For an expert, we know, oh, it can't possibly matter that you know, this, that, I don't know, that in this example, the handkerchief is red, right? We're experts. We know that that's, that's a detail, right? But, you know, if, if you go into detail too much on extraneous things, students start thinking that they're really important. So we show faculty how to think about weeding and go through and really uh, try to, if they can, really reduce the amount of concepts in, 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 a, in a video that students need to understand the video, to try to do it, try to do it in this more segmented way, right? And try to do, and try to go through everything in there and ask, do I really need that? Do I really need that? And then again, what you're going to use some of your synchronous time for is making those connections. So I don't know. That's 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 me kind of throwing everything out at once. We could do a whole thing just on the cognitive theory of multimedia, but really think about the sorts of things you're doing in the classroom uh, and how that's help helping organize the lecture or presentation for the students and they have to be they have to be done some way in the online world uh, as well. We do a lot in our faculty presentations of thinking about how faculty use physical space in the classroom because a lot of the things they struggle with come down to that issue. We've talked about Zoom conversations and one of the things we see is you know in a Zoom conversation and you call on someone you call on one out of 40 people it's lightning from the sky right for these students right. When you're in the classroom, what do you do? You walk over to a corner of the students. Those five students know one of them is up to give a response, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So they're, 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 they're working on that. They're working on right. that, right? It's, it feels less lightning from the sky, but it's completely embodied, you know, in a way that, that faculty don't even think about. It's a great point. And before we do our go, go around, just to note that everybody here is at the secondary level, and I named that because actually the longer students are in school, the more we would expect that they get how school works. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're a little more practice as a student and now all of a sudden you're like, okay, he's walking over here. So mm -hmm. I bet we're gonna get called on. Something that the more you're in school, the more you kind of figure out. Yeah. So we are working with young people who use those cues in a lot of ways that aren't necessarily here.
Let's just go around and it'd be great to hear from each one of you, like a takeaway you could imagine acting on. And maybe we'll, we'll go, we'll, since you might remember the order, we'll just go as we did before and start with David. All right. Uh, well, thanks. So yeah, so I think I'm going to, as my next step is go back to my pacing plan and kind of pull out, you know, start, you know, pre-recording those short stories and, and, and making those videos. And now that I know the thing about the, the speed of voice, I don't have to read it like this, you know, just kind of just read it like I would in the classroom and do the, the funny voices that the kids love. And so kind of get ready for that and then break it up with some questions and pause it and kind of do that, that little interaction piece. So I'm looking forward to it. Ooh, Catherine. One thing you said that really stuck with me is, you know, starting with the online version, what would this look like online? And then thinking, how can I translate some of those elements to my classroom? So even though, you know, I might not be meeting with my students face to face, how can I integrate some of those more immediate asynchronous activities now where they're used to it later so that we can continue that routine? Lauren. So I was going to say the same exact thing because that pretty much blew my mind. But something else, just the marking up on the PowerPoint, I did the voiceover, but I never did the marking. And so I think even just seeing you do that in this presentation was really helpful. So I'm going to start doing that with my flip lessons and any PowerPoints that I do. And Two of the things that, that stuck with me was, uh, I think you said you posed or you, you said something or was like, what kind of problem is this? Is this a pedagogy problem or a policy problem? That's just something I need to kind of keep in the back of my mind as, as we're talking maybe in departments or when I'm talking with colleagues, you know, is this a policy thing or is this pedagogy? And then the other thing is with the conferencing that, that I had originally brought up and we'd kind of talked about with, you know, privacy and stuff like that is that flipping or that reinventing rather than looking at it like we said from classroom to online how do we make it online and then transition back to the classroom because hopefully you know we want to get back in the classroom with our students so that's where I'm, I'm thinking excellent jessica almost a direct echo of david just uh to pre-record my short stories and the short stories for the co-teacher I teach with in English. I mean, I used to read aloud entire novels for the level my students are at. And I don't know if this is the right situation for that, but I might pre-record myself, you know, like so they can see me as if I were there, not just my voice. Yeah, and with the uh, English learners, one of the big things that people are thinking about too, just because you brought it up, Jessica, in a lot of cases, recording a story or something like that audio only is wonderful but for english learners seeing your face and seeing your mouth is huge and so being able to record you know with almost your your face really filling the screen so they can see that is really important and then they could play that over and over again and adjust the right. speed and that type of thing well, everybody, that's actually a good segue to the fact that we have a bunch of resources that will be included. Mike, for example, has um, a blog that we'll be sharing the link to that covers a lot of this. So there's a way to review this content. And it might be folks that, that you want to get back together again in a little while and talk after a few weeks how it went. We'll send out an invitation again. And that's kind of what we mean by a collab. So I'm going to go back here because this is signaling, Mike, when I go <laughs> yeah. back to spotlight video that we're wrapping up here. It was really a pleasure to hear from you. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll be following up with this team. And if you're a viewer, just follow along. We'd love to hear from anybody about the solutions they, that you come up with that actually we could all use and share in the National Writing Project because we have such common interests. So thank you, everybody, and thank you, Mike. We're going to close out here, and this is the National You're Writing Project. NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP.